All right, we're official. All right, so I'll start with the, uh, we just did that. What we're gonna run through tonight is we'll do welcomes. I'll run through the agenda real quick. Don't get too nervous because some of these things will go, uh, go a lot quicker than they, they looked at, they might. Uh, then Robin will do an overview of how we got here, the curriculum, what we've been doing, some of the challenges. Uh, I'll talk about the AMA members and the clubs and how they fit into this. We'll do a little Q&A. We'll have a little break if needed. Uh, we'll do a consensus on that. Then I'll come back and talk about this teacher training clinic concept. And then Robin will talk about educators using their recertification credits for our clinics or mentoring. And then Robin and I, I'll take you on a quick little journey through our Facebook album that basically gives you a picture version of, of what we've done. Uh, and, you know, pictures tell a thousand words. So then we'll whiteboard, we'll do a little discussion there. We might even do that at the, at the initial Q&A. Um, and then we'll work out a tentative schedule, uh, whether we'll want to uh, do another Zoom meeting or try and put together a clinic, pick a venue, a date and a time. So that's basically what we're going to do. So uh, how about some welcomes? I'm going to stop uh, sharing here for a second. Let's just go around the Zoom room here and uh, everybody just a, a brief who you are and what your affiliation is and why you're here, why you're here tonight. Why don't you start, Andy? Uh, you're up in my left corner. Why don't you start? Sure. Andy Agenio, I'm an executive board member. Been on the AMA board now for 18 years. Prior to that, I owned hobby shops and whatever. My original education was in engineering. And I was an engineer with RCA for a number of years as well. Excellent. Uh, I'll just go around on my screen. How about you, Ron? Um, Ron Funnis. I uh, am a member of the Rams. I was a member for some 37 years. Then I dropped out for about seven. And then I am live in Roxbury, New York. I mean, Roxbury, Connecticut. I'm a member of Fly. I'm vice president of Fly RC and um, trying to develop a, a program of principles of flight for the fifth grade in Roxbury. And the same program will be adapted to the fifth grade in um, Bradley Elementary School in Derby. Awesome. And so awesome. Um, that's, listen, I'm, in my background, I'm a research scientist. I have a PhD in uh, microbiology biochemistry. So, Terrific. Thanks so much for being here. I appreciate that and your uh, outreach efforts. Uh, Kenny, I see you down there. Hello. I think you Give came in a little off late. Off mute. <laughs> yeah, we're just doing a little, just doing a little intro. Just uh, tell us who you are, why you're here, and uh, who you're affiliated. Sure, Ken Donahue, um, electrical engineer. Do a lot of software. I am um, an officer and the lead flight instructor for the Flying Eagles up here in New Hampshire. Uh, this whole thing fits in very well with a uh, STEM program that I was trying to put to, to put together as well. So I'm very anxious to leverage a lot of the things that you guys have already worked on. Terrific. Okay. I'm avoiding myself and I'm going to hold myself to last. Uh, Tom uh, Sywick, our new uh, AVP. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. My name is Tom Sywick. And as Darren said, I'm the newest uh, associate vice president for district one. Uh, in addition to that, I'm the Vice President and Secretary of Central Massachusetts Radio Controlled Modelers, which is in the Northboro, uh, Massachusetts area. And uh, among the things that I, you know, quote unquote, specialize in is flight instruction uh, for the club. And, uh, you know, my interest is, is helping in any way possible to continue to bring new people in the hobby and get them started on the right foot. So when, when Darren had indicated that we were going to be working to expand the STEM program that he and others had started, I said, I'm, I'm absolutely on board and I'll, I'll do what I can to help uh, contribute to the cause. Excellent. Thanks for coming, Tom. Appreciate it. Tim Souter. Hello, Tim Souter. I'm uh, president of the Southern New Hampshire Flying Eagles. I'm also uh, in the FAA. I'm an airspace and procedure specialist uh, after 40 years of being an air tra traffic controller. And in my career field, I actually do, uh, I deal with Lance and those kind of things. And I also uh, deal with letters agreements for airspaces within Boston Center's airspace. And uh, I am also an intro pilot for the AMA. So I, I hope to do some good stuff here. And I just signed up for the FAA STEM program as well. Uh, so I guess I'll be an air traffic and a drone specialist for those brief meetings. And I'm hoping to combine the two and as uh, Don, uh, Kenny said, we're gonna try and get something going at the uh, South of New Hampshire Flying Eagles as well. Thank you. Terrific. Johnny Yaz. 
Well, I guess uh, the Southern Hampshire Flying Eagles is pretty represented here. Uh, <laughs> we have, uh, I belong to five clubs and there's, there's no doubt in my mind that the uh, we got a great group with that particular club. Uh, I'm the vice president of the club also, contest director, uh, uh, intro pilot, uh, district one AVP, uh, technology and safety officer under Andy. Uh, I've been doing that for probably, I don't know, four or five years now, maybe four years. Um, been an AMA member for 30 something years and I've uh, been teaching um, as well for a long, long time. And I'm a professional uh, UAS pilot now. Uh, kind of got out of my engineering career and took this, uh, something I always wanted to do. So uh, I'm doing, I'm flying full time. And I deal with people like Kim all the time, <laughs> which is kind of funny. And hopefully, uh, and Darren, and you know, I've worked uh, with Darren um, quite a bit in the past. Uh, my old job was very flexible. So, uh, you know, running to schools in the middle of the day was, was, uh, was pretty easy for me to do. It's a little tough now, um, but I'm gonna see what else. Uh, I can add to this group of people here and see what I, what expertise I can be able to help out with. Awesome. Uh, we got a great group of people here. Thanks, Johnny. How about yeah. Randy, one of our educators, Randy Weld? No audio, Randy. You're unmuted. That's weird. You're unmuted. I'm going to try and go ahead. Try and, try and unmute. Now. There we go. Got it. Okay. Randy Weld. I'm the STEM teacher at Greenland Central School, um, a K through eight school in Greenland, New Hampshire. Um, I had the pleasure of teaching uh, Darren's daughter when she was at our school when I started um, too. And then uh, a couple of years ago, um, did an after school kind of uh, uh, aeronautics program for some of our younger students. Um, and Darren jumped in uh, with full enthusiasm as he does um, to help out and <clears throat> that culminated with um, a, a fly demo. And I know, John, you were there, if I believe, maybe. Yep. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure if anyone else here was there that day, but that was kind of the aha moment for me. Um, and then uh, uh, have been seeing some of the cool stuff Robin did over at Ride Junior High um, the past few years has really kind of laid a, a groundwork model. Um, that I'm hoping to emulate. Uh, next year, we've got some changes at our school that are going to make doing this at the middle school level possible. Um, I've been kind of working this year to kind of get the st structure in place um, to do a full model aviation program with some of our middle school students. <clears throat> so we're going to be uh, looking to use some of the flight test um, planes and, and doing the building and flying next year. So I'm hoping to tap into this network um, heavily to make that possible. So. Terrific. Uh, op, uh, optimum uh, takeaway from that was network. And that's the, that's the whole real key. Um, Robin, how about you? Robin Elwood? Sure. sure. Um, Robin Elwood, I taught uh, eighth grade science at Rye Junior High School for probably about 27 years. And then I switched to the STEM STEAM program. Uh, we actually started, I was the one that was able to take the reins and start that program for the school and was there for three to four years and with doing that and um, got really excited when I stumbled upon this um, AMA modeling program and really wanted to take advantage of it and bring it to the students. So I was super excited to be able to try and um, go, go through some growing pains that we're hoping this, this process will alleviate that for future teachers and people that are trying to get into it. And I'm just so grateful to have all of you AMA folks here that are willing to, to help all of us out that aren't as skilled and um, as adept at the process as you all are. So thank you all for your uh, efforts on this endeavor. Thanks, Robin. You're going to hear more from Robin tonight. Um, John L. It just says John L. NHFT. Yeah, that's uh, John Lavery. I'm I'm uh, vice president of the New Hampshire Flying Kite. Flying oh, Kite. Okay. Um, I'm a retired carpenter. Um, been flying for I don't know 40 years or so, um, and it just sounded like a great program to try to get uh, the Ham New Hampshire Flying Tigers involved with uh, with some of the local kids around here in the schools in Derry, New Hampshire. Terrific. Thank you very much for tuning in and joining us. Kyle, Jaris. Hello. 
<laughs> Musical interlude from John. There we are, man. <laughs> hey, and here he is. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, Kyle Jarris. I'm the education director here at the Academy of Model Aeronautics. Um, I got started flying when I was about 12. I got into sailplanes, high start launch, winch launch, because engines were too expensive. But uh, I fly about everything. Uh, I have a lot of fun. Um, you know, it's great to have a flying field uh, right outside my office. I can take a quick break and do that. Um, formal training, uh, visual communications, so graphic design, art direction, that sort of thing. And uh, I've been doing the education director thing uh, for a couple of years. And it's been an awesome ride. Uh, great experience. I'm surrounded by some great individuals that help me. Uh, and uh, so I can kind of look at things from more of a design uh, perspective in terms of how we try to address issues. Uh, but ultimately, uh, the only way I'm able to be in this role is to be surrounded by great people, uh, both uh, volunteers and here at the headquarters to help out. So really, I see my job as trying to help uh, facilitate as much as possible uh, what the boots on the ground are doing, which is, you know, what I'm surrounded by today. So I uh, appreciate each of you and all the efforts that you do. Uh, you know, the Academy of Model Aeronautics couldn't do uh, anything without our volunteers and the people that really care about this hobby, that want to see aviation endure uh, in advance through schools, uh, through retirement homes, through, uh, you know, Johnny walking down the street that sees you flying your plane or something that, that wants to get involved. So, um, happy to be here. All right, Kyle. Uh, Kyle, can I just mention? I sent you the email about the rubber-powered gliders. This I afternoon. see it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Awesome. Okay, uh, Andy Fagan. Yeah, hi, Andy Fagan here, uh, member of the uh, Fremont Flyers Club, uh, in which I've had various uh, officer positions throughout the years. And uh, I've um, assisted Darren on some of the previous programs, education programs he's been involved in. Uh, Robin, I remember working with your group and uh, also Randy. Very nice to uh, see you guys again. Uh, my involvement in model avi aviation goes back about 60 years. Uh, and my initial involvement in it actually kind of led me to my career. Uh, which I'm a retired electrical engineer. Awesome. Thank you, Andy. And I think uh, Michael Witten, I see you there. Yeah, so uh, I'm president of uh, Charles River RC, uh, Mike Witten. Um, we have a, we're in uh, Sudbury, Massachusetts, so Metro West Mass. Um, and uh, yeah, our club focuses on, uh, we have a lot of sailplane pli pilots, a lot of electric, a good mix of stuff. Um, personally, I'm into the freestyle and racing quads. Uh, so I'm here to see, you know, just any way that I can help or any way that the, you know, resources of our club uh, can be of any assistance. Terrific. Thanks for coming, Mike. I appreciate that. Um, Darren Hudson, for those who don't know me, uh, my day job is an international airline pilot. I'm a career uh, aviator. I've uh, been in the aviation my entire life. Uh, I used <laughs> to be a uh, aerobatics instructor, flight instructor. Uh, really enjoy uh, instructing and outreach, uh, educational outreach and public outreach are my two joys in uh, model aviation right now. And uh, the, the words that I heard ring out while we were doing intros, uh, network, volunteers, facilitator, and pers uh, perspective. Uh, we'll concentrate on all those tonight during this program. Uh, so that is kind of the theme. Uh, what I wanna make sure everybody understands here uh, is that we are not pigeonholing anyone, uh, just the opposite. We're trying to give a, 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 an overall perspective of having perspective. Um, and that's really the key. Uh, think non-traditional, think out of the box. Uh, don't think one size fits all. It doesn't. It doesn't for education. It really doesn't for anything. So kind of have an open mind here and think of how you can take your brainstorming and your ideas and adapt them better to maximize everybody's opportunity for success. That's kind of one of my little taglines. Uh, so, so let's get to it here. I'm gonna go back to the uh, point. So we just, and I'm gonna give it over to Robin here, and she's gonna give an overview of how we got to where we are. And she's got a little presentation too. Uh, Robin, I'm gonna stop sharing right now. Okay. And you be able to share yours. Yep. I got it. And, and here it comes. Awesome. 
hopefully everybody can see that okay. So, um, as I said before, I kind of stumbled onto this uh, aero modeling project program idea um, as a STEM educator trying to bring some more authentic experiences, hands on materials to my students. And um, I had some missteps along the way that I'm not ashamed to admit. Uh, but I would love to avoid any teachers coming into it to, to help them get into it a little smoother with less turbulence in their, in their learning how to get the program running. So that's one of the things I would love to see happen. I want to help other teachers get up, get set up, get help, and get going really successfully. Um, and let's see. It's not letting me turn to the next slide. There we go. Um, so this was sort of more for teacher perspective because we were hoping there'd be some teachers that weren't quite sure. Um, so I wanted to just make sure all the educators, I know this is being recorded so that will help understand sort of what aero modeling is. And obviously it's much more than just what's here, but this is a good kind of summary. Um, and it allows students to, first of all, you can actually use things that are already built and already designed and made for you. You don't have to build or design your own, but it gives you the option to either create, start with something that's already exists or build your own or design your own or build a kit from a kit and fly everything from free flight items like, this is not letting me turn things on here, um, like these FPG9 flyers, these foam plate gliders that you start out with a foam plate and you turn them into these little mini gliders. And you can do so much aeronautics and understanding of flight principles with just such a simple little um, device. And I had a frustration with another educator earlier where they said, well, my kids are too young to, to do any of this. And I was like, no, then you can do all of this. It's, it's doable. But that's because there's a misunderstanding. And I want to try to help people understand that. So as you all know, you can start with these, you know, non, non, uh, powered planes, you can use rubber band powered planes and then move yourself all the way up to, you know, the foam, the foam planes that are powered as well as the already made with safe technology and all of those um, advantages to help students learn how to fly. Um, so it also allows you to learn and apply and get a better understanding of scientific principles and not just like Newton's laws and all of those, but also the electronics and um, how to actually build and design go through all of those principles. And from an education standpoint, we have to hit certain targeted topics because those kids are going to be tested on those. So we have to make sure that we really are a, a facilitating their understanding of those. And if you can have a project that not only talks about the concepts, but then the kids can apply those concepts and see the effects of those concepts, it's just magical. So it just seems like such a no brainer to me for this program to be an uh, integral part of, of schools at all grade levels. It's hands-on, it's interdisciplinary, and not just in terms of interdisciplinary with the sciences. You can you know, talk about the electronics, you can talk about the phys laws of physics, you can get the mathematical equations in there, you can get other topics as well, like history and um, social studies, all these things with how aeronautics has influenced our world. So it's, it's way beyond just building a model. And it's, it's really exciting to be able to have teachers start to realize this. It's collaborative. It can be in competitive if you want it to be, but the kids love it when it's going well and it's, and the, and the kids are, are experiencing it. It's, it's magic. You walk in the room and the kids are engaged and they're, they're excited about it. Um, this is just a, a picture of some of the planes from uh, last year, I guess. Uh, this would have been a seventh grade group that made these planes. Um, and I wanted to, to point out, these are all the same model planes, yet every group made their design theirs to look a little differently. So that got in some of the art part of it that gave them a little uh, creativity. And I added some things, Darren, this is not really uh, electronical stuff, but 
when I first started this program in the school, literally the day our class started, we went into lockdown and shut down and everybody went home. And so the kids had no materials, no supplies, nothing. So we started, okay, well, let, we, we started with some paper airplane experiments and all of that, but then we brought in some of the history of aeronautics and some important airplanes in history and the kids could pick which kind of airplane they wanted and then they actually went and made models of those planes so this is a little course airplane so again they're not going to fly these planes but they built it they designed it they had to make some measurements and do some calculations um, and this was another student's uh, you know he even had the the grab hook for it for it. So he was all excited about that. And I'll just show a couple others. Uh, Amelia Earhart's plane. This was a, a student's picture of her plane. And then we had them build these informational flyer cards. So it's it, it can be so interdisciplinary. It doesn't have to be just um, you know one, one aspect of it. This was a little stinker plane that uh, one of the kids made. Anyway, and then of course we did the Wright brothers as well. You gotta, somebody's gotta do those, right? <laughs> At any rate, um, the other thing that I really love about this is that the girls and the boys were equally engaged. They were loving it. And it was the, the younger kids, the older kids, kids of all abilities. It was really everybody got involved and everybody got excited about it. And when you have something that has that effect on kids, it seems it's a no brainer. It's got to be part of um, what if, if if people are interested, it's, it's got to be part of what you're trying to do. And uh, those that know me, like Randy knows me a little bit, uh, Darren now knows me a little bit. Um, when I find something that I really believe passionately about, I will jump right in. And I had this gut feeling, I don't jump in aimlessly or, or carelessly, but I had this feeling that this was going to be significant and it was going to be impactful. So I jumped in and maybe a little foolishly, um, I'm going to share my original goals. And I am now that I know more, I am quite embarrassed that these were my original goals. <laughs> Darren and I had quite a few conversations about this, but I, I, had, a good, wait, I had a, I had a good chuckle <laughs> under my breath the first time I met Robin and she told me this before she had ever flown a model airplane. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I, I would say that these are still my goals. I just have a little more realistic timeline of these goals. But so I wanted the kids to be able to build planes. I wanted them, we were going to take the kits. They weren't going to be designing their own. That was a little more than I was comfortable taking on. So we, we were getting um, foam model kits for them to build. Um, and then they were going to learn all about the aeronautics. We're going to do all the flight concepts, everything. We're going to learn how to fly their planes. They're going to get out in the field. They're going to fly. Then they're going to fly obstacle courses. <laughs> and then they're going to do target drops where they're going to have like trajectory motion and targets on the field. And they're going to drop things down onto the field and earn points. And then we're going to put first person view goggles on and we're going to fly with planes and our cameras on the planes. We're going to have competitions and on and on and on and on. On and um, I realized very quickly, rut row, I needed to put the brakes on. Um, but because to be clear, Robin, be, to be clear and, and, and just uh, shake my memory a little bit, this was all in one, one semester. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no problem, right? <laughs> but I mean, that just goes to show. I mean, I, I, I had found something that I thought would be innovative and exciting and impactful, but I didn't have a full understanding of really what it would involve. And, you know, I, I laugh about it now. I was like, oh, sure, we can do all that and, and I'll figure it out. Um, and I, as it's very obviously, I en ended up realizing that I knew much less than I thought. Um, and, you know, I was still learning ju even just terminology to the planes and, and how an RC system worked. And, when I would go to try to order the parts for the kits and the batteries and the and the chargers, I didn't even know what the material, what those items were. So I'm like, I, I don't even know what this does. How do I know I'm getting the right one? And although I called some certain agencies and they were very helpful, um, they we got I got hooked up with batteries that didn't the the um, leads didn't fit the chargers and there was you know all these problems and. As an educator with a limited budget and limited time, 
I didn't have the time or the money for those mistakes to happen. And then I also realized, I was like, oh, I'll just go get a new battery. And I go down to Radio Shack and, yo, no, they don't have those things. So it became really, really, really difficult for me to, to run it as smoothly as I had hoped. But, you know, I didn't, I didn't know how to fly an RC plane. I had never tried it. I didn't have any experience. I just figured, okay, I'll learn how to do this because I'm, I'm good at figuring things out. I'm, I'm motivated. I'm determined. I'll figure it out. But the clock was ticking, the, my semester was running by me fast, and I had already jumped in. And so at this point, I was feeling um, like, okay, I needed help. I either am going to abandon this project. We have, the kids were excited because we had started building and they were pumped about it. And I was now at a point where I couldn't do what I needed to be able to do to help them proceed. So I either had to make a decision, either I'm going to abandon this project and okay, we got what we got out of it, or I'm going to find help. And luckily I stumbled into Darren and, <laughs> and uh, it was quite coincidentally, um, but it, it, it just a godsend and all of you folks and all the stuff that you've been doing have just been so helpful. And we were able to get the kids back on track, get the batteries connected to the chargers, get things in the right positions, learn how to do things that I wasn't sure how to do, and um, get them back into um, get them back into success. And so I want to be able to pass on the knowledge that I've learned, the knowledge that AMA already provides, the the information that's already out there, so that other teachers don't have the misconceptions that I had, but also don't have the missteps that I had and that they can get in and be successful right off the bat because the, the time is ticking and they do have a very limited amount of time that they that they can, they can try to do this with the kids. So um, we wanna be there to support the teachers so that they're not flailing in their swimming pool, but they might not be leisurely swimming around drinking Mai Tais, but they might um, be a little bit more comfortable. So we want to be able to help the teachers figure out what it is they need, how much time do they have, what are they trying to accomplish within that time, and have them set up realistic goals and, and uh, things that they can do within that time, where to get the stuff. Um, I was searching endlessly for things, and when I look back on it now, um, I can sit there and say, okay, I would now know where to go to find this stuff. But when I was out there on my own floundering, I didn't know. And there's websites everywhere and everybody's saying this, get this, get this, you need this, you need that. And I didn't know what half of it was. So I was really just kind of scrambling and um, it was very unnecessary. So I wish I had caught up with Darren much sooner than I had. Um, but also then how to set up the stuff and how to use it. Um, and how to build the planes. And I know like uh, uh, with the foam planes anyway, I know Flight Test does a wonderful job with they have step-by-step -step instructional videos on how to build these planes. That's very helpful because you know the, I can show the kids, the teacher can show the kids, they can use that video as, as supplemental review and or, or just that instruction itself. But even knowing what I know now, there are little tips and tricks that are helpful that aren't covered in those videos um, that are would be very helpful to the overall success of the kids. Learning how to fly, maybe not in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the sense that I originally wanted, like the, the obstacle course and the goggles and all that, eventually, sure. But learning how to fly so that uh, they can at least make a straight flight and maybe land and turn around and make them back. But, when I was doing it, I got to the point where the planes were built, we were ready to start flying, but I didn't know how to fly. So, and I didn't know how to help them fly and I didn't have the skills to buddy box with them. So if we had let them fly on their own, all that work that they would, you know, they'd have crashed them and there's some benefits in, in learning to that, I understand, but it's also very disheartening if every single plane just, just crashes and you crash and burn. So to be able to provide a venue for teachers to be able to learn the basics of flying and have the experience of flying themselves so that they can better guide the students to be able to do that will be invaluable. And I want to start a, a mask club um, at the junior high school and we'd love to be able to help other teachers start a club as well. 
be able to understand what AMA is planning, um, how AMA can help. And then we'll talk more about this later, I think, Darren, but uh, the teachers, it's, it's hard to give up a lot of time if you, if you have to have all these other recertification credits and you have to take all these other courses to get the credits. So if we can offer recertification credits for time spent in this training, it really helps the teachers out in a very simple sense for them as well. So it, it, it will attract more teachers that way. But I want everybody to be able to have fun and uh, be successful. I truly believe that this is a magical program that, that's being developed and um, can have huge influence on, on kids and it's applicable and authentic um, for all kinds of reasons. So anyway, I'm very excited to be part of it. I'm very excited. Uh, to have made my missteps and to have caught up with Darren, who's been very helpful. So, Hi. thank you very much, Robin. Absolutely. I'll stop sharing and give All it right. back to you. And I'll roll in. Uh, before I do that, just quickly, I know uh, that we're we're uh, eating up the clock, but does anybody have any immediate uh, shorter questions? Because we are going to pause for some Q and A. Does anybody have anything that's just really really uh, biting at them right now? No. Okay. So I'll continue. All right. So, we should be sharing that. All right. So, Darren, where and how do the AMA members and clubs fit in? This is a sneak peek. You guys are all seeing this, correct? Yep. Okay. A sneak peek of the May issue of Model Aviation. This is going to be the um, uh, the district news for District One, and you can see that it's based on educational outreach. Uh, Andy told me, and uh, Chad Boudreau from AMA, the new initiative is to do uh, what they're calling evergreen articles. Basically, having some timeless articles there, uh, not so much on events as they are on uh, information. Uh, sharing information like we're doing right now. It was very timely, and uh, I did this uh, last week, and we got it all in there. So it's it, you're going to see it in May. Um, the uh, one thing I wanted, and this this slide is going to drag quotes from this and information from it. Uh, but uh, right here, uh, the key is understanding the teacher's perspective and adapting to their challenges while in, uh, including flexible use of AMA safety and educational programming. So I'm going to get rid of this and we'll go back to uh, the slideshow. And so remain flexible. Teachers' schedule skills and resources are limited. And, and th this is basically backing up what Robin just talked about. Think outside the box. Uh, utilize the teacher and the venue friendly models and techniques. It might require something different than you're used to doing. And again, here's perspective. Uh, st uh, STEAM teachers and students are often not aero modelers, uh, like Robin just explained. That is a common theme. That is not the outlier. Uh, so we want to create a mentorship and an instructor teacher relationship and partnership. So listening to their needs is really key because they are so limited that our normal programming doesn't normally fit into theirs. This is always, this should be item number one, actually. Uh, it's, it's actually item number one, two, three, four, five, and an infinity. Always keep it fun, but keep it fun for the students and the teachers. Got to keep the teachers motivated too. And then we have many outreach opportunities with this. Sometimes people don't think about this, but teachers and students today can become modelers and members tomorrow. Plant those seeds, you don't know where they're gonna go. Right now we're talking about focusing on education and helping the teachers out, but we're friend raising also. When you have kids, you have parents. When you have teachers, you have administrators and all those people are part of the community. So you've automatically expanded uh, aero modeling outside the hobby community into the greater community, which is what it's all about. And Robin also uh, talked about the mask, uh, model aviation school clubs. And when we talk about free sites coming up and education institutes, institutions being uh, available for free sites, we also can talk about shared venues, possibly. Uh, that's not a guaranteed, but beginning relationships is, is a key. You go into a school, you have a, a classroom event, don't just talk about the day, talk about the future, talk about what you could possibly do more and work from there. 
All right, so we've uh, covered this so far and I'll bring up the whiteboard if necessary and we'll do some Q&A. So I'm gonna unshare this, stop sharing. Yeah, hey, Darren, I got a, a comment based on, on Robin's you know, presentation and that. I think one of the ways the AMA members can really help out is she talked about some of the learning curve and frustration of just understanding the componentry, not just from what she needs, but where to get it, right? And if she was working with somebody who had experience in this area, that learning curve could have been completely flattened and somebody could have helped her understand the nuances between power equipment, batteries, best places to get them. So instead of running around trying to find this stuff, I can tell you today, just about everything that you would need, you can get on Amazon, right? You just got to know what to, what to search for, right? And somebody yep. that has the experience in this area probably could have spent a half hour with you. And you would have been so much further ahead if you had had that guidance when you started out. So I definitely think that's where AMA members and that can really contribute the most to help educators is to say, look, don't beat your head against the wall with this. It's not as complex as it seems. Focus on these things and you'll be able to get what you need relatively quickly and get going with your lesson planning and get your kids engaged very quickly. Absolutely. That's, that's absolutely true. And uh, when Robin and I talked uh, initially, uh, she came to me, I was a Horizon uh, ambassador and she gave me a cold call and she said, I bought this apprentice and they said you were a, a flight coach. And that's how this happened. It was, it yeah. was serendipity for sure. And when we first talked, she had gone down those bad paths already. So when we sat there and she showed me all the stuff she had, yeah, there was some shaking head moments at the trunk. I'm going, oh and, boy, and the other I wish, thing you, is, I wish is Robin, you could have talked to me a week ago. You know, what, what you went through is the same thing that our newbie and more inexperienced members go through. They, yep. they have the same struggles. And if they just reach out to their fellow club members and say, hey, look, I'm looking to go this direction or that direction with the hobby what kind of feedback do you have to help me get through this a little easier? Like, like it can be so much easier than people make it if they just reach out to the right people and say, Hey, help me through this a little bit, because the rest of us who've been doing this for years and years and years, we've already gone through those learning curves and, and we can absolutely help others not have to experience the same challenge that maybe we went through earlier on. Absolutely. That's, that, that's absolutely true. And that is part of, that's why we're talking, Tom. That is exactly why we're talking because, no. the, yep, go ahead, John. No, 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 that, you're right. Uh, you know, Darren has reached out to me, you know, Robin was having problems with like how to get the radios to work and Vine and buddy boxes. And, I, and, I, and I'm listening to Robin and I'm sorry to jump off my father's doctor felt, um, but I'm thinking that, you know, what we already came up with might not necessarily be the best fit to go forward, we're evolving. So if we, as AMA members, we could say, hey, look at, you know, we need a radio, a receiver, we need safe setup, we need, if they're going to build it for a flight test, you know, pick the best airplane. And where AMA's members, we, we could pre-test everything. We can make sure the radios work, the, the receiver's already tuned to that airplane. Um, they're all, the, the teachers have to learn, if they're going to buddy box, basics. I mean, when we go to clubs, we put new pilots through um, all kinds of training. And this isn't the best fit for today. This is just get your foot in the door, learn how the plane works. You can successfully take it off, line around a circle. We don't expect the kids to fly inverted and instruct to pull it out of a nosedive at 100 miles an hour. And they're not gonna show up with a, you know, a 100 mile an hour airplane. We, we, it's, it's baby steps. And if these children pursue it, then we have an avenue to go to a club and get the more advanced training, but we can't expect the teachers to get to that level, but we have to give them something that's safe. That's not going to go really fast. It's not going to go out miles away and land in a highway. It's very limited size. And so that's where I see that the AMA got, you know, as clubs or volunteers that we could say, Hey, this school needs 30 kits or, you know, what's the best one. Can we pretest everything? Who's a volunteer to do that? Who wants to go down there and help them? And, and put a, a group of people together like volunteers amongst the whole community. Yeah, so that seems like need. That, that probably goes without saying, 
but safety, safety, safety. Yep. Not just yeah, absolutely. in flight, but on the bench. How to properly and safely handle lithium batteries, how to properly set up these airplanes yep. and not get struck with a spinning prop, you know, all that kind of stuff. Go ahead, Andy. Oh, uh, I, I just wanted to try to roll it back a bit and get a better idea from the educators that are on. In order for us to work with you, we're supplying you with the tools to achieve your behavioral objectives in specific areas, whether it's math, science, engineering, whatever. So for us to know that, we should really start with you first. And then as you begin to explain to us what your needs are, we can tell where we need to go in terms of providing you with the proper tools to help to reach that objective. So what I'd like to know is, can you develop some kind of uh, a platform or a program or, or something that just like you wanna show us something and you have something that you could show us more relative to, uh, and it's gonna be different for each class. And I guess each class, even teaching the same subject, each teacher may have a different approach to how they're gonna teach it. So are you recommending, or would you say that there should be like a base program, very general, and then something more specific? Uh, just, I, I think you know where I'm heading here. Try to give me some input to that, if you would, any of the educators. Go ahead, guys, if you wanna comment there. I will only say this, that, that a lot of the comments that we're hearing are gonna be addressed shortly. So then we're gonna have another time to, to chat after, after we're all done. So keep that in mind as well. Robin or Randy, do you have any direct response to Andy on that? Um, I, I would say, and Randy, uh, certainly chime in if you want. Um, I would say having programming that's already at least established, mapped out, would be helpful to educators that are interested in getting involved and might not know where to start. So if you have like, this is this is program one and maybe program one is just all about the FPG nine or whatever it might be. And then program two might be obviously different names, obviously, but um, right. something that, you know, brings the process forward. It progresses a little bit and different teachers are gonna take things and run with them differently. Um, mm -hmm. But if they have something that they can hold, that they can they can rely to lean back on, um, it, it's very helpful. Well, when you're prioritizing, uh, let's say we wanted a, a prioritization of it in terms of, you know, the science, the technology or whatever, I guess it depends on the age group and the school that if we're working with the grammar school level, uh, obviously our nine program, you know, the, dealing with the circumference and distance divided by time, you know, to figure out speed, all that kind of stuff relates to that. So we have another program relating to something else. So, uh, so I'm, I'm trying to think of what our best approach is and is it, it's obviously got to be based on a span of age of, of classes or whatever they are. Uh, within a certain uh, spectrum and then to prioritize within that or should we be developing or having Kyle develop programs uh, to meet uh, generally all the needs, all the STEM needs? When you say all the STEM needs, like yeah. I'm not quite sure what you mean by all the STEM needs because that's pretty expansive. Well, so. that's what I'm saying. So, yeah. so we'd have to divide them out and, and have them separately often so that the teachers that wanted to use each one would be able to tackle them, although they overlap. Certainly when you're building a model, you're doing everything, the electronics end, the building end, right. the systems approach from the human to the pilot, to the yep. flight, to the flight systems. Yep. That's probably the best intro course. And I guess as, as you move forward, you may specialize more. Yep. And, and I think what, um, I'm sorry, I think it was Tom, I think talking earlier, just, you know, if you have a list of these, this is what you need to have. And I know that stuff exists, it's out there. But um, when I was trying mm -hmm. to find it on my own, because I didn't know who to reach out to, um, you know, looking back, it all seems so obvious. I could have called any of you and it would have been fine, but I didn't know at the time who to call or what to do. Yeah. Um, and when you look when you look at all the different things that are out there, it just becomes a jumbled mess. And I know all the modelers experience that, but nothing will turn off a teacher from trying to make a program work if it's a disaster cluster right from the beginning. <laughs> so if there's a list of, okay, if you're gonna do a modeling, if you're gonna do FPG9, Chris, you need X number of foam plates or 
however you want to arrange that. If you're going to do a foam plane build from flight tester, you're going to use the simple cubs. You need X number of kits per student. These are the things that don't come in the kits that you need. You're going to need these transmitters, these batteries, these power packs, these, you know, whatever it might be. Um, just to really streamline it so that it makes sense. It's quite overwhelming if you don't know what you're looking for. Like, I didn't even know what I didn't know, to be honest. I was just like, whoa, let's do it. <laughs> and, I, and I think even with the flight test stuff, the power systems in those airplanes, I think are designed to be removable, right? So yes. if you want to build 15 airplanes, you don't need 15 power systems. You could have the kids build the airplanes and swap the power systems right. in and out when they're ready to go fly them. So I think there are very economical ways right. to go about it that help fit within an educator's budget. And I think to your point, the key is, is just understanding, well, how big do you want to take this, right? What kind of scope are you looking for? Are you looking to stay purely within free flight, rubber band flight? Are you, are you looking to expand the power flight? And then I think the guidance can be very much tailored to these different pathways of curriculum. Yeah. yeah. Guys, guys, I'm going to I'm going to move it along just because all the themes that you're talking about are going to be presented. The theme that I'm getting from this one discussion we just had and the key factor that we're trying to really get across right now is we want AMA resources to be at the top of the list of the educators. In other words, we want the Robins and the Randys and the Chandras and all the other schools to know if I'm going to do aero modeling in STEAM, I call AMA representatives. I call my local clubs. I call my, uh, my district uh, officers or I call education department or I contact them on the email. That's our job as our outreach. When we go to these schools, we leave them with that contact information so it's there. So we're in their phone book. We're on their bookmark. And we're the ones that they come to. So let, let me move on with the with the program and we'll have a chance to talk at, at the end again. So that was very good. Does anyone need a break right now? Say you do. All right. Moving on. Hold on. Here we go. All right. So break's done. All right. I'm going to talk about these uh, training uh, clinics, which is going to point out some of the things we've talked about already. So the teacher clinics, this is a picture of a teacher clinic I did with Randy with oh, my sharing. You guys yep. see that, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. So this is Randy. This is Robin. And this is Robin's successor, Chandra, who couldn't be here tonight. I showed up with uh, some UMX airplanes at a, a ball field in Greenland. I said, well, we'll get some chairs. Let's go fly. Number one, let's go fly and have some fun. And then we sat and talked and we, and we basically did this. So why? We want to simplify the training. And John, I think, pointed it out too. Non-traditional for many of our modelers, many of our clubs. This is not a club training program. This is a training program to get somebody to a basic level to teach basic level. So simplify the training for STEAM teachers. Address their needs. Address the needs of an enthusiastic educator with limited time, limited resources, experience, and skill sets. They have all the desire in the world. They don't know anything, just like a newbie, but they don't have it as a hobby. They have it as a, as a job, and they have strict deadlines and constraints. So we have, to be, we have to be aware of that. And then create access to the tools, the resources necessary to carry out their goals, not our goals. We want modelers, we want members. That's not what we're at right now. We're at helping them succeed in their goal to create and plant the seeds and cultivate modelers in the future. And then provide support through the members and the volunteers, through the clubs and local level. And then that's why Kyle's here through the Academy Model Aeronautics Education Department on a national level. Programming, educational uh, toolkits, uh, resources. And if you didn't see the chat, I have a resource sheet that Kyle did. I added a few to the bottom of it that I'm going to send in uh, with an email, a follow-up email. So you'll all have all that sheet. Um, so don't worry about that. All right. The clinic, how? Develop, train the trainers. So AMA and, and mentors with non-traditional techniques, very basic. So you see me there with UMX. Some clubs might say, oh, we only train with 60 size uh, glow trainers. You're not going to take that to a schoolyard. You're not going to take that to a ball field. You're not going to get teachers to come out to you or kids. Eh, fail. 
there's where the flexibility comes in and the perspective. So you have to keep that in mind. We want to su uh, successfully create an introductory instructor. So they're teaching middle schoolers to fly straight and land, maybe a turn, maybe not, maybe a circle if you're lucky. These are not going to be full solos. They're going to be basic development tools. And then here's the real kicker. AMA instructors transition to mentors. Once you get that, that uh, teacher to a basic level competency, now you transition from the main instructor and the main pilot to the mentor. You step back and help with the class and help with the, with the school. And you're, you're weaning yourself off of this teacher's coattails is what you're trying to do. And then the teachers, this is the real winner. Teachers transition to peer to peer. So then you have teachers teaching teachers and then hopefully youth teaching youth. Mm. So then the teachers join AMA as a full adult or a part-time uh, park flyer member, establish masks, and then potentially we have shared venues and we continue that mentorship. And John pointed out, if that is successful and those kids wanna keep on going, now they venture out to the clubs with their parents. Because trying to get them out to the clubs for a field trip, it's not going to happen. I'm telling you, seven, 10 years of doing this, that's a hurdle. So we have to adapt. Um, so uh, then we expand the movement out to other districts, locally and nationally. And then we have teachers, administrators, and students becoming STEAM liaisons with AMA. Friend raising. This is something I use a lot. You're going to see in that article in May. Uh, uh, what I just said, we want AMA to become the go-to for STEAM educators. We want that to be the call, the first call they make, not the last call, not the second call, not after making a bunch of mistakes. Make the first one and have our people train such that they're giving them good answers. Um, then the volunteers are going to encourage participation. And then we, again, we do the outreach. These are all the things we can talk to teachers about more in depth at a two, three, half day or a full day clinic. And then lastly, some of the challenges. What are the challenges? Finding a venue to do this, scheduling it. Of course, we went through that and I appreciate you guys all hanging with me with the doodle and all the other uh, techniques that I tried to use to get people together and then finding volunteers. I really appreciate all of you being here because you are now the network that's gonna go out and hopefully educate other modelers about this and your clubs and then get back to us and we keep this circle going until we some have some results. So Darren, I was thinking uh, where you were going with this about, I think we even have to train the trainers, the AMA members that volunteer because that's what, we don't, that's the we other don't part want of the them going job. and giving mis mixed messages. That's why it's important to have the AMA pick those components because we don't want you know, me going and saying, oh, we'll buy it from Horizon, you know, get these servos, uh, Hobby King's no good, go to Amazon, do this. Um, if we had a list of components, maybe an alternate uh, of some of those components, I think it just, it shows unity. It shows less confusion. We want the teachers to be successful with something that's proven. And, you know, we have to go in there with that attitude. Like most of the guys in our club will push an apprentice or, you know, Aero Scout or whatever. But other clubs like, oh, it's got to be nitromethane. You know, it's mixed messages. So just keep that in mind. It's not only our opinions as personal modelers. We need guidance from the AMA and come up with those programs. So we can. And that's the that's the here. whole that messaging is is absolutely necessary, John. And, and that's why the the key word there is perspective. We're not taking it from a modeler's perspective. We're taking it from the teacher's perspective. This is the bubble I got to work with. You guys, most most people, most traditional models, a teacher might have this bubble. A traditional modeler will say, well, this is what we got to work with. And we don't, we got this. <laughs> so you've got, you've got to squeeze your stuff in there. And when you try to do that with certain, you know, if somebody says all we do is nitro, uh, 40 size nitros in a schoolyard that's a baseball field, guess what? That doesn't fit in this bubble, pop. Yeah. So either adapt or like we do with clubs, if that's not part of your game, direct them to somebody else who's adept at doing that. So the flexibility is key within reason. So I don't want to, I won't pigeonhole anybody, but I also want them to have the ability to have some flexibility, but some guidance like you're talking about and not have, not have to be tucked into a corner um, mm -hmm. and not steer somebody the wrong way. Absolutely. And training the trainers is key to that. 
Yeah. The time constraints is, is, is probably one of the hottest things we're going to face. I mean, I, I saw the kids disappointed when we went to, to the school and taught them in the gym for, you know, half an hour. I was like, oh, bus is here. I'm like, what? We just getting started. I think I was more disappointed than they were. Ex <laughs> That's, exactly. You know, you get used to that. Exactly. Robin, uh, do you, you, taught, you, you talked on it a second and maybe just give a, a real quick and dirty for the, for the AMA guys, because Randy obviously understands this. Um, about the recertification. We, Robin and I were talking about it and she was saying, well, you can charge for these clinics. I said, eh, well, we can't really. Um, but other ways, what do we talk about that we could we could do? We were talking well, about the supplies. Yeah, I mean, just so everybody understands, as with obviously just about any profession, um, teachers have to have recertification credits to keep their credentials up to date, whether it be science or STEM or whatever their content area is. So um, being able to offer recertification credits for teachers to participate in this would potentially um, attract a greater number of teachers or make them at least understand that there, there's some uh, external value to, for them to be able to do it. And uh, Darren was talking about uh, teacher, so the schools have money appropriated for teachers to spend on recertification. So if there's a workshop that costs $150, the teacher can request that $150 to go take that workshop and get recertification credits for it. But if we can offer credits and maybe they do pay the $150 or whatever the fee is, and they walk away with a model airplane or uh, whatever the whatever it might be, because um, I don't know how that works with AMA, like you can't charge because it's nonprofit, but I don't know, Darren, you might be able to explain that a little better than what I'm doing. A flight simulator. Uh, Kyle could probably yes, take that. that would Kyle be could probably amazing. take that for us. I hope yeah. those are notes you're taking, Kyle. Oh yeah. We charge all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we don't make a lot of money. You know, it's not about the profit, but we do have to cover costs in a lot of yes. instances. So yeah. Yes. But as far as, as as far as us going out and charging for the services of a clinic. Um, that would sort of be a conflict in my mind anyway. Um, I don't know that it would be. I would have to ask smarter people than myself, uh, okay. which I can certainly do. Um, I, I wouldn't be too hesitant right off the bat, uh, especially if we develop the national program. And because that takes effort, that takes work, that takes you know hours and manpower to put that together. Yep. Um, and as such, now there, there might be opportunities to get that finance through a grant process. But um, you know, those are all things that, to explore. Okay. Well, Ron, did you have your hand up? Ron? You're muted, Ron. You have to unmute. There you okay. go. Uh, we did this, uh, Fly RC did this, a program which you're talking about at the local high school for about 10 years. And at the time, the kits were um, donated, and there were three to four students per airplane. And these were 45, um, I think they were uh, 45, uh, 40 size trainers. And um, we had volunteer uh, uh, Fly RC members went in once a week to help these kids um, build their airplanes. And then at the end of the year in the spring, they would bring these planes up and um, attempt to fly them. Uh, the questions I have at this point is, first off, the um, curriculums in school are so tight to get the program even started. The program that I'm talking about we, that we, um, we worked on, it was in their transportation class. So it was set aside. And what happened as the um, student population changed is they couldn't get any, any students that were interested. And the next, so we, we stopped this about four or five years ago. Uh, the next question, I addressed the time issue. And how, where, in the, where, do, where does the financing come? You know, to do this, this nowadays there, there aren't freebies. In days of old, I don't remember who we got the trainers from but it was one of the manufacturers. I fortunately have a, a philanthropist that is willing to, to underwrite the, um, the program. And uh, my association with Junior Achievement 
they are so excited about it. They want to get out of their niche as far as financial literacy and bring this program on board. And they're going to underwrite the, um, uh, the purchase. So we're, we're focused on rock, rockets because they're, they're very easy. And we're getting these that you clip on the fins and what have you. You can, you can give the talk on, um, on principles of flight, why things fly, how things fly. The original uh, program that was listed, I have in my slides, um, uh, laws of motion and Bernoulli's principle and demonstrating that. That's in high, that is tough to fit in in a two hour time frame. And that, that, that's where I see the, the big issue is how, how you get the program into a high school program when the, the curriculum is so, so tight to start off with. Um, I could, I could uh, speak to that a little bit and, and um, Randy obviously jump in too. Uh, it, is, it is always a challenge to figure out how to get the amount of content that you're supposed to cover in while you're doing a project but so one of the one of the things that i've always done is instead of doing a say powerpoint on uh, newton's laws of motion we might be building the plane and the kids are moving the flaps and getting the thing getting the servos moving and we start discussing those things as they're doing that and then it's mm -hmm. immediately applicable they might not see the result in terms of flying at the time but you can at least you know, hold it in your hand and say, okay, what would happen if you turn the flap that way? And then they mm -hmm. start to do that. So um, you sort of consolidate how, how you're presenting it. It's, it won't be like do a lesson and then do the work. It's kind of everything at once. And the other, the other piece is if you can get other teachers, like part of this interdisciplinary thing, if we can be building the planes in STEAM class and in science class, they're talking about Newton's laws of motion and doing a little more in-depth discussion on that, that helps as well. And in math class, if they're talking about some other things. So yeah, um, my, my focus in this is just getting kids interested in, in aviation. Yeah. I'm, 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 we're focusing on a fifth grade. The program I uh, talked about where they built, these were seniors in high school. Yeah. And uh, the other question I have is with the teachers, there's a certain segment of the, of the class that are gonna be very interested. I mean, the excitement we, I, I visited the principal today and we went in and into the uh, fifth grade class and we asked, you know, how many of you are interested in, in um, uh, a program, you know, talking about flight then we mentioned that we would these rubber powered gliders we were going to do and then we we're going to build these rockets and put these and launch the rockets in the afternoon and these kids i mean they were they jumped off the wall because this is something that is outside of you know dick and jane and and learning it's it, i think it's it's exciting at the, the uh, elementary school level that it, that will will bring kids back into the hobby and, Ron, uh, I'll I'll yeah. talk I'll talk to that a little bit. Your conversation yeah. with Robin, um, yeah. the forty size trainer. You said, yeah, the kids aren't interested in it. adaptability, right? Being flexible and adapting to what the kids are doing, and not not coming in with a program to tell the teachers about. Going to the teachers and say, how can I adapt what what I've got to you and your needs? That conversation has to take place before the club all assembles up and goes, hey, we got all these trainers, let's go build them. That's not the way to go about it. You got to you got to make a plan. So that's awesome, and you've done that. You've adapted now. You you're using the rockets as a hook. Awesome, a fun hook. And you're going to teach yeah. them some. And you're going to teach them some aer, uh, aerodynamics and and uh, um, and engineering. And you're going to utilize the resources from AMA. That's what we're talking about. That's exactly what we're talking about. Adaptability. So do you, any, do you teachers have any grant programs that are available? Now, when we had my shops, we sold to the colleges, the high schools, uh, the tech schools. They were getting Perkins grants at the time. I mean, it wasn't uncommon for them to come in and spend uh, universities that spend three or four thousand dollars. High schools were spending fifteen to eighteen hundred dollars almost every year. It was just part of it. We got set up as a uh, as a place to go. We got ourselves set up with the state so we could do that. And that's how those programs in those days got funded. Of course, a lot of them were through the robotics programs. And then some of the robotics of teachers moved right into aviation because they were Aussie pilots anyway. But that gave them the basis to 
to at least get the product. So are those programs still out there? I know, for example, FAA put out $5 million about a month ago. Uh, they put it out to a lot of the colleges, accredited schools, junior schools, the tech schools, and a couple of high schools. Uh, I'm not sure what the criteria was, but I'm certain as educators, you know where to go to find out about that. And that's probably the most important part of all of this. If you can get the dollars, then you can generate these programs. Because that was the first question that came under the principal's mouth was, oh, where's the money coming from? We don't have the money. And as I said, you had, I, you had a good answer for him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, if you, if that, that part of an that. information source is to here's where the school can get uh, money to develop these programs. I, I've but, got a thought on that. Like, go ahead, Tom. I go to swap meets and I see guys all the time looking to unload older equipment for pennies on the dollar. Okay. There's no reason why if we have local communities that want to start to build these kind of programs that we can't along with them go to some of these meets and see hey do you are you guys willing to volunteer some of this stuff that you're willing to let go of for pennies on the dollar to help support a stem program right well, it's, like, a, it's, 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 it's tax it's, deductible to start off yeah i mean if it doesn't they, always they donate to stuff it doesn't always have to be funded new equipment, right? Yeah. Like, like there's plenty right. of resources out there where you can get stuff really inexpensive. People just need to be pointed to the right places to be able to explore those avenues. Yeah, I got something to say about that too. But Randy, I know you wanted to talk about- yeah, Randy has his hand up. Stuff, so. Well, it, it might be what you were, I might be jumping in. What you were gonna say is, uh, this is where AMA could step in and be a liaison for this process. Um, something that could be, really would help a lot is um, you can almost have like template um, budget because any grant writing process is gonna involve a detailed budget. So there could be available like through AMA, the budget template for if you wanna start this program or that program, and it's got everything laid out there, you know, where to procure it, I've even seen before agencies, I've seen this with robotics, where you might even have some verbiage right in there about the benefits of the program, something that would allow an interested educator to literally pop on, start doing some copy pasting to expedite that grant writing process. Um, in addition to that, too, I don't know if there could be somebody that has, it when, when they do hear about possible opportunities, that they're kind of posted to a resource so that educators can kind of almost like AMA playing matchmaker. Um, between the possible grant agency um, and the educator. Anything that makes that, because I've written a number of grants, I know Robin has too, um, they can be kind of daunting um, to do from scratch. Um, and some of the ones I've been successful at have been when there's been an agency that's kind of given a starting point for that. So that was one thought I had on the whole funding issue. That's a, that's a great idea. And obviously we'd make ourselves available to do that. Uh, I can recall in my day, uh, the people either come to us and stay in the shop and take a program in it, and we fill in the blanks of what they needed to put in there for them to give them the expertise they needed. Uh, whatever area it was in, even in University of Rhode Island bought tons of submarines for us to do their marine biology stuff. They were all RC stuff, and uh, we would help them to write the, the program for that grant based on the products, and they'd use that as part of their presentation for the grant program. So. We certainly can open the door for that capability. And that's more, I mean, all the themes here are getting in touch with AMA, getting in touch with, with people who can help them and getting the word out that, that there's a direct line. Right now, it's a real broken chain and we need to fill that chain in. Yeah, I got, I got all the funding for my initial run um, through a grant. And then once I had the initial stuff set up, so that we had the transmitters and we had a lot of the reusable stuff that we could reuse each year, um, that was all acquired. But then the model kits each year went into the school budget. So mm -hmm. there's sort of this upfront cost, get everything like the, all the simulators and the, that sort of stuff. And then there's the consumable expenses that should be able to get put into school budgets, but that can be really tricky. Um, but one thing I, I just wanted to, to 
bring up one point quickly to respond to Tom, um, which I, I think it's absolutely wonderful and appropriate to go and, and um, appropriate these, these things that people are giving away cheap or getting rid of cheap. But I want to just caution um, understanding that when you're the teacher in a classroom with 25 kids, you it's really hard if you have seven different models going because they can't then have a common conversation. Um, I did it once with two different models going and that was okay because we had enough of each kid making the same model. But if you have, you know, Johnny's on this one and Susie's on that one and Peter's on this one, it gets yeah. really confusing for everybody. So I, continuity. I, I, was, I was more so talking or thinking about transmitters potentially okay stuff, gotcha like stuff that's universal gotcha that actually, actually kind of some model. of that stuff isn't because yeah, to say transmitters are, it might be one of no, the worst things yeah. <laughs> yeah so so let's let's take a step back i mean this money we're talking about money and you know building the program i think we need like most of the stuff we're talking about is, isn't even money related it's getting a solid program that's basic the understanding the right people to get with the teachers and have a program that they can follow. And yes, we could put it into columns of, you know, FPG nine, does it cost really anything? A couple of paper plates, you know, and a few pennies. And then, you know, all right, if they want to move to, okay, we want to fly RC, what, what, what's the best fit? How much is it going to cost? They need to know. And how we put our people together with the, with the teachers so we can get them to the basic level and, and how we, coordinate that you know put a schedule together with each with each community because you know i live in nashua darren's out you know out in green green greenland you know there's so many schools that can participate and it there's a great opportunity and if we just spend the time to do that one simple task of breaking it up and it just a, and stay solid you know stay on this curriculum like i said we can always break out later i mean yes as a modeler like we're saying tom you know buying stuff cheap is great uh i don't even think we're that's not even a concern right now the concern is just getting the information to these kids that are like sponges they you know so many of these kids they're going to want to know how, how it works they're going to see it we're going to do a demo for them and we're going to build that little spark and excitement and then they're going to want to learn because if they don't if we just show them a kit and a bunch of work it's like it's work i want to see let's like ellen was saying you know uh, while they were moving the, the control surfaces around, then we explain how it all works. It's like you just gotta. Um, I don't. I. I, I don't God, I'm gonna. I'm gonna take that as a great segue and share the screen because Robin and I are gonna take you down a little memory lane. Take a couple minutes, but it's gonna take you down a little memory lane, and we're gonna see some images that define what you're talking about. Um, so let's see what we got here. So we're gonna go to. A Facebook album that I made with Robin's uh, class. So let me know if you see you see a Facebook album here. Yes. All right, Robin, I'm going to ask you to chime in as you want. So this was Robin Elwood, Darren Hudson, Horizon Hobbies told me to call you. I have an apprentice and a trainer. What can we do? <laughs> That's how this started. And so we we met. And we started talking. And as we started talking, we said, it's COVID. What can we do? I said, well, I've got a simulator at home. I've been doing these Zoom meetings. Well, we have Google Meet, Darren. Let's try and do a Google Meet. So we went to a test. I put a train around here. I expanded it to 200% so people could see it. It's a little heavy. You can see it sitting on the gear heavy. I put the, put the uh, radio up. I put a close version in. And I gave them a virtual control lesson after they watched AMA's total control about control inputs. And when we did that, this was going on at the school. They had three classrooms with this setup and they were able to get a virtual lesson and they had the same setup that we had set up. And I, this isn't the, they, they were practicing in this picture, but the one I had was Concord Skyhawks field up for them. So I gave them a virtual field in New England to look, to fly at. So, um, they're doing the exact same thing we do as modelers at the flying field. They're watching each other fly and learning from each other at the flight line. Here's the flight line. Um, when we got outside, this is the, the first group that we did. And this is what Robin was talking about. They had two different um, models. 
and we found that that wasn't that the the uh, continuity wasn't there because they had different flying characteristics. So when you saw one group flying the heavier model and the other group flying the lighter model, they weren't really learning the same lessons from it because its characteristics were different. So then we decided that it'd probably be better off. This was at the end of the program. I donated a, a mini apprentice for them. That was more for Robin and teaching teachers than it was for teaching the kids. Um, but that was the, the, the um, purpose of that. Uh, I wanna show you something in here. Um, I'm moving my cursor over uh, certain genders here. And I want you to count how many young ladies there are in this group. And it was great for me to see this being <laughs> the father of a daughter who's learning how to fly. Um, they were, the girls were psyched and they were great. This is COVID out in the schoolyard. Uh, that's why they're separated. I went and did a demo. We had a q and I had all different models. I had an FBG-9. I had a, a Chuck glider. I had UMX gliders. I had uh, flight tests, um, the Alpha Bravo and Charlie's. They, those look like jets. Those are cool, Mr. Hudson. Fly one of those. And we talked and we flew and we had a great session for about an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. This is Andy Fagan, who's joining us tonight. Andy came over when we were doing our inspection day and maidens. Um, they weren't able to learn how to fly, but they were brought to an inspection station and they got returned many times before I took the airplane and maiden it. And we were pretty, we were pretty stiff with them, weren't we, Andy? We were. And, and they uh, turned around and they learned and adapted and they had to change controls on their uh, transmitters. They had to reprogram reversing servos. I told Robin, it blew me away one day because one group of boys, this group, I said, guys, let's check the controls. And it was reversed. I literally turned around and they said, here you go, Mr. Hudson, we're ready. Because they adapted in like a half an hour. It was crazy. And this was one of the best flying airplanes. So they got some aerobatics and a loop and a roll and they were going nuts. This was a trainer day that we, we took the kids out. We said, pick one person from each of your teams to be a designated pilot. Cause we just didn't have the timestamp to do all the kids. So we let them do a little democracy and choose somebody. And all the, tr the designated pilots came out to this field across from the school. And they all learned how to hand toss an airplane and fly an airplane. They went up on a buddy box. It's got a safe technology. They flew out, did a couple circles, came back, did a landing by themselves. And they were, they were happy as pie and they, they learned and the other people learn from it. So, and of course we talked about safety that is always here. And even, even shared venue uh, um, etiquette was discussed this day because people walk their dogs in this field. So we discussed that. This is Robin with her bling from AMA. This is part of the education educators kit. And this is all her stuff. I wanna bring up the point with this picture I don't have one of Randy's room, but when I went into Randy's room and when you go into STEM and STEAM classrooms, you see a bunch of compartments and, and shelving like this with different projects. You see robotics, you see, I think Randy did a card, was it a cardboard boat you did with Hannah's class or something? They had all these projects lined up. All we're trying to do is have AME be one of the cabinets and have aero modeling be one of the cabinets that they can reach to. This was Robin's class. She set it up like an exhibit and the, the teams all were out and they were graded by other teachers. Their parents and families could come in. This reminded me a lot of the SAE Aero Design um, International Competition, the way the kids do that up at uh, UNH. It was one of the teams. This was uh, an opportunity for me to donate some more swag from Horizon to them. And that's when they gave me the... Uh, the nice thank you note from the kids. And uh, they had such nice things to say and we had a, a blast. And this is the picture that uh, Robin had again for the arts. So I just wanted to share that with you guys just to give you a, a pictorial version of what Robin and I have gone through and to give you an idea of the idea of flexibility and coming outside the box. You know, a, a lot of people wouldn't say, why are you using that UMX timber? It worked fantastic. I, I probably re CA'd the prop shaft on that thing five times during that day. Um, and then I subsequently went out and got the aluminum mod shop uh, <laughs> prop shaft that they make for it. Um, and when I donated one to Robin, I made sure it was equipped with an aluminum prop shaft for that reason. But 
you know, where there's a will and where there's a, a willingness to be flexible, there's a way. And um, I was a one man show with Robin's help. If I had another modeler there that was engaged like that, we could have split that class up. We could have had the whole 40 kids out there doing that. But we just couldn't because I didn't have anybody else that was trained as a trainer. So Johnny's got his hand up. Go ahead, John. Mute, mute. I forgot to put it down. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Andy, you had your physical hand yeah. up. Yeah, all right. Uh, no, I, I was going to disagree a little bit with John. We, we usually get in these little pushbacks to each other. But in terms of, it seems to me that the common denominator here is that it's a project base. And that project that you're using to teach a particular skill set or to get through a STEM activity is best if it's a common project that the team can work on. So that when you have a measurement and you want to look at the outcomes, you've got metrics that are the same, and each team is adding to the value of the other team. So, you know, sometimes just bringing in a lot of different things that you get for free might be nice. They might enjoy that. It might be experimental, but it's very hard to use that as a means to an end. And so I, that's, that's, I just wanted to point out that it does come back to getting the grants. If you get the grants, you're going to be much more successful with the programs because the programs then are going to have and meet the objectives that you want. And they're going to be consistent from, and, and measurable, the outcomes. Kyle, did you see the text? Did you see the chat from Randy? Yeah, good stuff there, Randy. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for that, Randy. Everybody, if you look in the chat, I, I don't want to read the whole thing out, but uh, uh, Randy put a great uh, note in the chat and it was about uh, scope and sequence and consistency and uh, the AMA website being updated. As a matter of fact, Randy, uh, for our AMA members and everyone here, we have a thing called POW, Program of Work. And there's a program of work for 2022 and that's basically the action items for AMA. One of those hot items is updating the, the website, updating uh, AMA Flight School and making it more accessible. So we, we hear it. We have been distracted for the past two years with government affairs and regulatory stuff. And quite frankly, we're tired of it and we're moving on with stuff like this. We're so pleased to spend a whole evening and not talk about government affairs. It's awesome. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. Making those resources more available. And speaking of which, <laughs> another nice segue. Speaking of which, mm -hmm. one second. Um, hey, Darren, Darren, yes. um, before you move on, I just, I just want to bring up, you just said the perfect thing a, a second ago. You couldn't find help. I was a phone call away. We need to get clubs to have a liaison. Absolutely. Like that these people can call. I, I would have loved to have helped you with that program. Absolutely yep. loved it. I knew nothing and about it. And I, I put I put it out on I, I put stuff out on Facebook. I put it out. Our email system is is not as good as we'd like it to be right now. Uh, you know, from our Zoom it. meeting, it's we need that communication link. We need we need all the clubs to know that this is out there. And the the keyword you said, and I mentioned it in the program, and you just mentioned it, a liaison. Yes, that's that's an important member of your club, a, a STEAM or educational outreach or public outreach liaison. Somebody who's somebody who's looking for that stuff. Hey, Darren, you're an AVP. What's going on with educational outreach this month? What can we help with? That's we need that. We need that continuity. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, so every club should have, have have a STEM a STEM relays on. Also, yep. money wise, when I was a mentor with 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 uh, with first, my my company was giving me five to twenty thousand dollars a year for first for first to support the program. Reach don't ask, your, don't get. We can tell to your companies, these major companies have programs. They love giving out this money. Yep. Don't ask, Reach don't out. get. And that's that's exactly. the motto with that. You got to ask. Exactly. All right. I, I just want to, there's a couple more slides here. Um, Andy, I'm looking for your advice here. We're coming up on the time. We're actually 736 right now. Um, uh, what's the consensus of the group? Let me stop sharing this for a sec. What's the consensus of the group? We have like two or three more slides, some items to talk about. One is a new product that, and a new SIG for AMA that is got some potential. Uh, we're looking into it and Kyle can talk to it as well. And then basically resources. I've got, I wanted to share some resources for you guys. I'm looking at probably maybe another 10 minutes, 15 minutes outside. Is everybody good with that? Absolutely. Cool.
All right. All right. So let me share this again. So um, we were talking about flexibility and out of the box. Um, so I want to introduce you to something. This is another video. Um, it's uh, called, I'm waiting for my controls to come up here. There they are. It's called Darone Soccer. Hmm. And it's AMA's newest SIG. Um, I want you to look at this video and think about it, not so much from the competition end, which is the ultimate end, but the educational end. And think of us as reps going out and introducing this to schools. I don't wanna, I don't wanna uh, give you too many more ideas, but that's kind of the way we're thinking of it uh, with this product. Then we can talk about it a little bit afterwards. So just why this is like a two and a half minute uh, promo. So give me a sec. We got real excited at first. It'll take me a second to share this. You should see some soccer ball sitting there and ready to go. Yes? Yep. yep. Darren, um, click on the bottom right, that little square. Well, I, you guys have any problems about uh, the buffering. That's why I did it, Jeff. Welcome to oh. Drone Soccer, an exciting new Where educational eSport. Okay. We're launching a national program to engage thousands of students with the thrill of flight and head-to-head -head competition. Right now, the aviation industry is facing critical shortages in aircraft production, mechanics, engineers, and pilots. We want to make high-paying aerospace careers accessible to all students. Drone soccer is a full contact team sport played with flying quadcopter drones. It was first invented in South Korea and is now an official international sport of the World Air Sports Federation. Drone soccer is played inside a netted arena for safe, dynamic gameplay that fits inside any school. It's just a great introductory program to get involved with aviation as a whole. We're working hard to build a national youth sports program that immerses students in aviation. But before all of this, we had to design a professional grade drone that was suitable for World Cup play and the needs of the modern engineering classroom. It had to be affordable, durable, and completely repairable. We spent a year play testing with teachers and students to get it right. We've been doing drones for about four years and struggling to understand what ties it all together. And U.S. Drone Soccer just delivered it in one perfect little neat classroom package for us. This is the Saker DS200 Drone Soccer Ball. Made with high performance drone racing hardware by leading manufacturer iFlight RC. A carbon fiber chassis, injection molded cage, and no need for soldering. We've also sourced market leading products from remote controls, tools, batteries, chargers, everything needed to get started in the sport. Your donations will help us fund school programs, national tournaments, and even the US drone soccer team for international play. I think this sport's gonna take off very quickly because we just last summer, we had barely anything and now we're up here doing all these events and showcases and then we're gonna have nationals in May and I think it's just gonna skyrocket. Help us bring robotics competitions into the space age. Kind of cool, huh? Yeah. Just a different concept, a different tool. And you guys will see my article in May. I use a, a catchphrase in Hello, there. Hello, everybody. It is Tuesday, March 15th, 2022. Hold on. For oh, sorry about that. Air. Coming up today, we're going to tell you how youth are getting involved in aviation. I'm going to share with everybody my story of the Perry Swap Meet. And we've got a preview of the upcoming April issue of Model Aviation Magazine. All that and more coming up today Quiet, on guys. AM Air. It was, it was a good episode today, though. Sorry about that. <laughs> little preview of uh, AMA Air there. Um, so I'll let Kyle talk to this in a couple minutes, and I will also because we're doing something. But uh, I wanted to offer a couple more things, and then we'll discuss. So we have some resources for you guys, and I'm going to email this to everybody as a follow-up. Kyle put this together, and then I added some other stuff at the bottom. 
So I'm not going to read through the whole list, obviously, but those are all hyperlinks and they'll all be coming to you and you can check out all those things. All the stuff Kyle put there is on AMA uh, flight school. It's um, not on the screen, Darren. It's not on the oh, screen. I'm sorry. Thank you for, thank you for telling me that. Yes. There we go. Sorry. Still not on the, there we go. So, okay. So all this stuff is there. Uh, I want to point out for the educators up here, this is the freebie. And I think Ron did this uh, free resources. You got to go watch the 45 minute video, which is helpful and has a lot of stuff in it. It talks about the FPG nine. It talks about some other uh, good techniques. And then you take a, a survey monkey and you get a box of bling and uh, it's good, useful tools. Um, there's other things in here that are great. And I'll let you guys discover those on your own. I would highly recommend taking a little browse through most of this stuff that goes for the AMA members as well. Uh, some of you guys may not have ever been on AMA flight school. Um, I hope so, but maybe not. All right. Um, and then the last thing I want to show you guys, and then we can have a little discussion and we'll, we'll start it back at the drone soccer. I just wanted to get through this, so you knew about it. Um, so you're going to get the follow-up sheet. The other reference I have for you guys, the AMA district one uh, website. And this has links to stand by. And you should be seeing the website now. This is our website. And what I want to concentrate on is this video is probably going to be highlighted somewhere in the, in the page, but all these buttons are one button clicks to all these resources. AMA Flight School, our YouTube channel, which has the education videos on there for, uh, for the um, educational outreach. I've added this one. This is the education uh, tool STEM program. I've added the Welcome Discover, the little one we saw at the beginning, Total Control, and the FPG9 Quick Project, uh, produced by none other than Kyle Jarrett. Kyle has a whole series of quick projects, and this is this is one that an easy easy peasy thing to do in the schools. I highly recommend it. It's uh, it's an awesome it's an awesome thing. Uh, so please reference uh, www.amadistrict-i.org. Uh, you've got like one-stop shopping to everywhere you need to go. Um, let's see. And that, I think, is all I have on the program. Let's see. I think a good place to maybe wrap it up, Darren, is, is just to say you know we'll put out another invite either to a meeting or 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 you and i can talk some more about um what the next step should be and and uh get everybody coordinated and moving <laughs> exactly uh, before we wrap and, and i want to come back to that and take a couple minutes to do that but before we do that let's go back to drone soccer because i want kyle to talk about it and i'll talk about it a little bit to tell you what's going on at ama and what i'm doing personally so go ahead kyle yeah sure um and uh, i mean there's a lot of great stuff happening uh we've been um you know doing great things um within the organization but also you know it's clear that you know great things are happening out there so just again to reiterate appreciate you guys um you know robin uh, Randy, some great comments, some great ideas. Um, you know, we've got a staff of, of two full-time employees that are, you know, directly involved with education outreach uh, here at the AMA. Uh, and of course, uh, two part-time staff as well. So uh, we are going to do our best to facilitate these things. As mentioned, you know, we've got a program of work. And Ron, if you wouldn't mind uh, muting your mic, that'd be awesome. Yeah, I'm going to mute you, Ron. We're getting Sorry, background I'm, noise. I'm getting there speech jammed. There you go. <laughs> Uh, but uh, at the same time, guys, you know, we're, we're running over. Um, it's been mentioned before, you know, trying to find uh, those leader members, those AVPs, those VPs uh, that know what's happening um, is important. But uh, honestly, reach out, um, you know, and you guys know me now. <laughs> so reach out to me, ask any questions, bring any ideas to me. 
um, you know, I look forward to sharing those. Specifically with U.S. drone soccer, Darren, that's what you asked me to cover, so I'll get to it. No, I'm uh, glad you added the other stuff. That's that's crucial. Good deal. Well, just real quickly, uh, respectful of your time again, but U.S. Drone Soccer, they're doing some great things. Uh, they started in Colorado. Um, you know, they've got a great uh, mentality and mindset in trying to get these um, small drones uh, that are in cages indoors. So we're getting away from lots of government things, lots of safety concerns and hazards, um, and really uh, setting up a program that is uh, start to finish uh, very doable for teachers who've never done it, for students who've never done it. And uh, honestly, um, I'm one of those guys that tries to do everything as cheap as possible because, you know, I'm mindful of, of those needs in, in uh, resourcing um, or the lack thereof. But at the same time, um, you know, this is a program that it is a little bit much up front, but their costs are very clear. It's delineated. Uh, you'll have an investment up front. Um, but uh, find some grants, find some access, and um, you know, get students involved through those methods. Darren, I think, has been conversing uh, with uh, Dave. I think Dave. Yeah, David Roberts. He's the he's the uh, the developer um, really in good the guy. U.S. And I haven't talked to Major Kyle yet, but I I want to. And yeah, what's the what's up with that? Kyle at Drone Soccer, Kyle and Kyle at AMA. What's the deal? <laughs> um, but just to let you guys know, uh, over the last week and a half. Um, I've reached out to them directly, and I've, I spent an hour on the phone with David. We were very excited about it at first. Uh, we, uh, I emailed them, and um, we went through a couple of transitions of them kind of understanding where I'm coming from, and they still don't quite get it. I'm going to make one more pitch, and I'm going to do that in the, in the guise of my article that, I'm, that I wrote for MA Magazine so that they get an idea of where we're coming from. And what Andy and I have talked about is we're the sales rep for them. So what I'm trying to do is get us a free or a demo or a loaner bundled ball so we can bring that to educators like Robin and Randy and others to say, here's how this works. Here's how we can interface with you. Now you go out and get your funding and you develop a team and we'll be your mentors for this. And then I take my bundle, we let them play with it and I go to another school. I can't afford, we, AMA and districts can't afford to fund teams. Uh, it's a, the whole arena, just so you guys have an idea, the arena set up in six balls is about a 12 grand uh, investment. Um, like Kyle said, it's right up front. Um, it's definitely a fundraising effort, but as far as where we're concerned with educational outreach, they're not quite getting uh, what I feel is a benefit. If I were them, it's like, wow, get like 10 of these out throughout the country and have guys like me going to 10 different schools. Holy smokes. Now you, cause you're not going to make that investment if you don't have it to play with, to try to, to see teachers aren't going to do that. So I'm selling it hard. We're in an email negotiation right now. <laughs> I'm glad <laughs> to hear it. Well, home. and part of it too, is, you know, they've got a limited supply chain, right? We've all heard supply chain issues. They're, they're dealing with the same thing. So yep. if they've got 10 people waiting on their kits, it might be a tough sell. Absolutely. I don't know what they've got going on. So just, just keep that in mind. Don't ask, um, don't get. That's kind yeah, of the, that's that's that I'm in too. is that. Don't ask, that's don't fair get. too. Well, so, and also just really quick, you know, hey, I really appreciate the ideas. Um, you know, I know that, that coming up with a whole curriculum, uh, I mean, we've got a curriculum, let's be honest, it's free, jump in, use it. But at the same time, you know, that curriculum is based around uh, free flight aircraft, rubber band powered gliders, those sorts of things that are great resources and can be a tool to get started. But once you get started into the RC side of things, once you get started into the technology questions and the battery, you know, the safety with it, it goes along with all those things, you know, mentorship is where it's at. Um, we're, we're providing uh, resources and continuing to do so. Uh, actually, on the slide, I shot a link over to Darren to take a look at a few of the things that are working on behind the scenes uh, at AMA to try to um, take things like this, conversations that we're having, and um, you know, produce those uh, for the better of the hobby, for the better of aviation in general. But that's what we see our mission. And uh, I'll shut up now. Sorry, Darren. No, that's all awesome stuff, Kyle. Um, Guys, we're, we're at 51 now. We're about 25 minutes, 20, 20 minutes over. Um, uh, before I let you go, Andy, I'm just going to just ask everybody, uh, you guys good with discussing some more? I mean, feel free to leave if you want. I, you know, uh, I don't want to leave you having a question or having a comment that you want to get out. So, Andy, go ahead. Yeah, the, the, one, the one thing I wanted to say before you leave is that 
the only input we were missing here is we're talking about youth programs and youth education and stuff. And I wanted to let you know that uh, at, about two years ago, we started exploring to set up a youth group made up of one person from each district who would be like me, so 11 districts, where each of these youth members would act as leaders within there. So they would be the, guy, the group that would coordinate, work together to provide us that, with that input to let them know, us know what the benefits, what the services are that they want, the programs like this, we'd have a youth member committee say that would be involved with us. So that's under it. We're finally getting to explore it. The board has set up a committee for that. And I think that's going to provide us with uh, another level of interaction that will give us some good information. Andy, I, I haven't, uh, we've talked about it, but uh, age range we haven't talked about, but I would assume the committee would be focusing on this middle school age, what I, what I dubbed the pre-drivers. Um, yeah, they, so they, they uh, have some growth in that goal. Yeah, the, the, most of the kids will come from that middle school, I would assume. Uh, but I guess that's up to the district. They have the committee itself will outline the structure of of where they're going to, the resourcing will come from. Maybe yeah. they'll be uh, elected just as we are, but initially they'll be appointed by the district VP, and then yeah. later the possibility of having them elected by fellow members. And then each member would then a youth member. You know how how these kids love that in scouting and everything else to have levels of uh, aviator status and then competition and all that. So, and, and it would be coming from them working together as a team and working together as a group on a national level. So I think it's an excellent idea. Where it goes at this point, I'm just saying it's in the works, meaning it could take uh, a while. Hey, uh, Alan, I have a question. So we were talking about, you know, middle school, uh, being a director of the science program, do you think that we should, you know, if we put a program together to this next level of RC, should it be tailored to high school and middle school? I mean, it's the same curriculum, it's just maybe go a little slower. Uh, you think, I mean, I'm asking, where, where, is, where is the sweet spot? Who are you asking, John, Ron? A Ellen. Oh, oh, uh, no, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Robin. 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 Sorry. You confused me there for a second. Yes, <laughs> sorry. That's okay. Um, I don't know if you tune that whole thing out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, um, I I think as I think a sweet spot is middle school level because you can okay. go either direction. Um, maybe upper middle school level, um, because that you know you can you can tailor it in either direction then and okay. and yeah. You know. Just to throw this out there, we're developing right now pre K curriculum as well. So for the very littlest ones to talk about getting excited about things that fly, um, you know, we're, we're trying to put resources out there that cover the gamut from that pre-K student that's two years old and learning what sounds a helicopter makes um, all the way up to collegiate level um, through competition and, and opportunities to engage through UMass clubs um, and beyond. Let's be honest, you know, to the retiree to that 90 year old uh, man or woman who uh, sees somebody flying and wants to get involved and uh, even wants to get involved with FPV. Sure, let's let's have at it. Here's how to do it. And uh, there's great ways, great resources available. We're always trying to make more and we're always trying to streamline that process. There you go, John. Uh, trying to streamline that process and make it more accessible for everyone, right? Uh, so that it's easier, easier to navigate, easier to find, easier to explore. Um, and uh, you know, and I'll I'll tag along with something that, that Andy was mentioning with the youth uh, um, input. Of course, we always want that. Uh, we have some uh, of that already that you know we can lean on and utilize. Um, you know, we have opportunities that we engage with students already. Um, and the biggest key to that is factoring in uh, what to do with what we learn and how to provide the resourcing to make it worthwhile. That becomes the question. Um, and whether we lean on, on volunteers, let's be honest, that's how we get most of our things done, right? Like I can't be in every school, um, you know, and, uh, but, but the good thing is, is we have good quality people who can. And, um, you know, this is, this is why I was excited to be here tonight, Darren, you know, to, to be able to see these amazing things happening and uh, to try to provide any support I can and to learn, you know, where I can. Well, I, I certainly appreciate you coming, Kyle, because you're an yeah. important link to this. And that whole that whole system 
of headquarters on down and then from the grassroots back up. Uh, that's what's going to make this work. Um, all of those pieces working together, all those chain links uh, together. And right now we do have a few links that aren't connected and we're trying to connect them. Um, and this is how we do it. You know, this has been great. So I'm, I'm asking who's left here and we'll do it with, with a follow up as well. Um, I'm getting the feel, Robin, that uh, another Zoom meeting is probably in order before we uh, send out invitations to try and set up any kind of clinic. Yeah, absolutely. And really get a good bite on on uh, educator participation in yeah. this and see, you know, I'd, I'd say the next meeting, I'd like to see at least, you know, six of those eight or 10 that we had interested uh, yep. participate. So let's focus on them. Um, if we have to focus right on them, uh, then so be it. Because uh, I think our I think our AMA volunteers that are here today, I think they're getting it. Do you guys all kind of get the idea? Do you get the gist after seeing it? Yeah. Thanks. Kenny. Um, I, I think what I'd like to see is what the curriculum is, what the, which I know Robin has already got, you know, what, what they expect. It's us. really, you know, we, we kind of, we talked about this and it's really not so much, give me the curriculum as it is getting everyone, especially the MA volunteers to have a philosophy of, really getting the perspective from the educator and and filling their needs with we have a we have a 20 pound a 20 gallon bucket of resources skill sets and, exactly. and stuff exactly they have to fill a thimble and we yeah. have to th fill it with our 20 gallons so we have to go to them saying really what do you need you tell me what you need and let me pick out of my bucket what i've got to make it happen it might be like kyle says it might be an fpg9 you can do four hours on an fpg9 or more you can do hula hoops with a with a, a game and talk about uh aircraft control and have a competition and the kids eat it up so and that's my point that's my point yeah. there. i could spend 12 hours with these kids and poor robin leaves and says we just spent 12 hours and we didn't hit a single checkbox so what i need to get done <laughs> so it's between it's between you going to the robins and having that coordination and that communication and it's tough too because every district even in the same state can be different. You know, yeah. what, what are the things that you need, you need your students to know for, for these, you know, check mark marks. Right. Yeah. And um, you know, you can say what you will about whether that's uh, a good or a bad, like there are certain standards and that makes sense. You know, we, I'm not going to jump onto that soapbox today, <laughs> um, but uh, at the same time, you know um, yeah. Having that conversation and being flexible to, to Darren's point is so important, you know, not going into it, I mean, we are, let's be honest, we're the subject matter experts, right? When it comes to modeling, we've been doing it for a long time. And yeah, we might learn a few things here and there. I hope you do. I sure do. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's really easy to go into that situation and come to a Robin and say, no, no, this is what you need. Be humble. Approach this with the, the idea of, hey, I haven't been in the classroom in a long time. You are every day. What do you need from me? How can I facilitate you? How can I support you in what you need? And that's really what it comes down to. And um, you know, if I could tell that to every volunteer we have, um, you know, I, I I will continue to. I, I do tell it to every volunteer we have. And so I was happy to hear Darren saying the same thing. And you know, it's it's this it's this idea of of being willing to learn new things and to uh, acquiesce to what someone else needs to teach. Um, and sorry, I'll shut up. Go ahead, Rob. I'll be I'll be telling them that in May, uh, Kyle. Look at the District One uh, <laughs> news; it's right in there. Um, I think I ended it with saying we're trying to provide. I, I talk about drone soccer, and I said this is just another arrow in an educator's quiver, and we want to be we want to have a place in that quiver, and that's really all it is. I want to be on that wall. I want to have AMA and models on that wall next to the robotics and next to the other projects. So you know we have AMA has so many different members out there i'm sure that ama has if not hundreds of teachers that are science teachers that are ama members that fly how do we find out who they are how do we put them all in we've got our model aviation student clubs it's a great way you know if you're yeah. a, if you're a teacher and um you know you know about model airplanes and you don't have a model aviation student club set up um let's let's talk tomorrow <laughs> yeah no you know, <laughs> you know what i'm saying like, but but we have access I, to those people. We can shoot emails. We can have communications. Right. Um, 
what I'm saying is like when I fill out my AMA application and I pay my membership, there's no checkbox. We don't know to get those people the information. So, you know, I talked to uh, Andy just this week. We, I think a club should have a president, a vice president, a secretary, and we should have a liaison, a public relations officer. Someone, you know, because so that's the one. friendly face. That's right. one and of the most important also things. Have, so add to that. Yeah, yeah, that's a checkbox. You know, it, it's required as part of a club. You have it, it could be the president if he's the friendly guy, but we definitely don't want him going to the old retired guy <laughs> who's uh, you know, like a, you know pulling you know bottles out of the basket, you know the trash. And I was like, first guy I see, it's like, oh well, you don't want to buy that. You know, it's like, yeah. You know, and, and someone that walks in and the first thing they say, well, you need to buy. You got to be a member. You got to get AMA. You got to join this. It's like, you know what? Put them up on a buddy box first. Get them uh, happy. You know, let them let them get the bite. You know, I like this. And all right, let me find out what I need to do it. It's the same thing with, you know, with the teachers. We, we don't want to like, you know, throw all this baloney on them. And Ellen's in an amazing position right now because she's got both sides right now. She's flown. She's got a trainer. She's seen the classroom and dragged Darren into this. And Darren's got a perspective that we haven't really seen. And he's just sharing it with us, which is great. So 